morning, everyone, and welcome to the, the Release and Become Conversation. We are so honored today, this morning and this afternoon, for those that are in other parts of the world to welcome a conversation with Ambassador Anwal Chowdhury. I am Barbara Ballard, author of Release and Become, and I'd just like to read Ambassador Chowdhury's brief bio. We can't read his old bio, or else the whole Zoom will be me reading his bio, so we'll go from there. Ambassador Chowdhury's legacy and leadership in advancing the best interests of the free global community are boldly imprinted in his pioneering initiatives at the United Nations General Assembly in 1999 for adoption of the landmark declaration and program of action on a culture of peace. And in March 2000, as the president of the Security Council that achieved the political and conceptual breakthrough leading to the adoption of the groundbreaking UN Sec Security Council Resolution 1325, which for the first time recognized the role and contribution of women in the area of peace and security. He served as ambassador and permanent representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations in New York from 1996 to 2001, and as the Under Secretary General and High Representative of the United Nations, 2007. Ambassador Chaudhry's legacy and leadership in advancing the best interests of the free global community are boldly imprinted in his pioneering initiatives at the United Nations General Assembly in 1999 for adoption of the landmark declaration and program of action on a culture of peace. And in March 2000, as the president of the Security Council that achieved the political and conceptual breakthrough leading to the adoption of the groundbreaking UN Security Council Resolution 1325 which for the first time recognized the role and contribution of women in the area of peace and security. He served as ambassador and permanent representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations in New York from 1996 to 2001. And as the Under Secretary General and High Representative of the United Nations, responsible for the most vulnerable countries of the world from 2002 to 2007. He is the founder of the Global Movement for the Culture of Peace, a coalition of civil society organizations promoting the culture of peace as the envisage by the United Nations General Assembly in 1999 and working in close collaboration with the UN. Most recently, I'm just adding on to your bio, Ambassador. Ambassador Chaudhry received the Soka Global Citizen Award for his life's work and achievement for peace, women's rights, equality for the cause of the world's most impoverished and disadvantaged nations. Welcome, Ambassador Anwal Chaudhry. How are you today, Ambassador? Fine. Happy World Healing Day. Yes. We, we are about to celebrate it because it is. 10 a.m. worldwide local time. So in New York, it, we have uh, nearly another hour to go before the actual uh, time on the dot starts the World Healing Day for 24 hours. We're so honored that we're talking to you on World Healing Day. And you know, we need so much healing, Ambassador. Oh my gosh. I don't even know what to say right now in 2021, but let's get started, okay? What do you consider the culture of peace? Simply put, uh, the, the culture of peace is a process of <clears throat> individual transformation. <clears throat> and I believe that um, uh, this individual transformation engages every one of us to decide that we will consciously decide that we'll make peace and nonviolence a part of our daily existence. I believe that that is the simplest way of explaining what is culture of peace. Peace becomes a culture of your life, that it, uh, anything you say, 
anything you do, anything you think about has a place for peace and nonviolence. And you can address the challenges of your life through non-aggressive, peaceful way. I think this is, this is the essential message which needs to be embraced by all of us. It sounds simple, but gets complicated when you keep or make peace and nonviolence outside your personal existence. And that becomes, people think that I can go to the street, I can hold a, a placard and declare, I want peace. But that is not enough. That is not enough. You cannot be peacefully demonstrating or shouting about peace, have global peace, and come home and become your violent self. And that, that is why we have been trying for now more than 20 years to promote this through the United Nations as such. How do you think in reference to the United Nations, how are they incorporating the culture of peace internally in terms of, you know, within their work methods, the way they're moving the initiatives, though, how are they doing that? There are many ways. And I think the, the focus on the <clears throat> individual transformation is very important. Mm -hmm. so we try to do um, two things. One is to incorporate the concept and the essential elements of the culture of peace in the work of the United Nations, in its mediation work, in its peacekeeping work, in its peace building work, and we try to bring it in. The other thing that we are trying, and this is a, a, a recent focus for the last, uh, say, five, six years, is to bring younger people. Early childhood development is mm. essential. Unless a child grows up with a peaceful atmosphere, in a peaceful way, learning about other parts of the world, developing empathy and compassion, that, the, the, <clears throat> that is what is important. And we believe that uh, some, sometimes <clears throat> we go to um, the a country level, <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, go to um, uh, higher level and we start talking about peace. But we need to start very early. UN has observed its 75th anniversary last year. But our focus on the culture of peace at the highest level of the United Nations is only 20 years old. I wish that we started talking about that from 75 years. We have been much better off today. We tried, uh, we, I, when I say we, I mean United Nations as a whole. You know, we tried to, to ensure that the world is peaceful through uh, uh, responding like a fire brigade. There is a fire, we call 911 and a fire uh, brigade uh, engine comes there, puts up the fire and goes away. Never ensures that that fire does not, they should ensure that that fire doesn't come back again. So that, that is the, the, uh, the sort of uh, uh, one-time effort in making peace. peace also, I will bring uh, another element here. Peace is not just absence of war. Peace is much more than that. It has to be able to ensure that injustices, discriminations, um, uh, prejudice, everything ends. Because without ending those things, peace will never be sustainable. So that is the important element that we are trying to now bring in in the work of the UN, 
in the work of humanity. And I believe that we should not depend on the United Nations for everything or even on our governments for everything. We have a role. We individuals have a role to ensure that we try to contribute our own, whatever we have the opportunity to do, we have to do that. So that, that is why I'm emphasizing that the culture of peace is of course an individual transformation, but that individual transformation should lead to collective and institutional transform, transformation. So that, that is necessary. It should be comprehensive, but it stood, should start with each one of us. It's interesting what you mentioned about children, because I read in your most recent book, you know, you mentioned about how you should start extremely early, like three and four years old, and also how you spoke about your childhood and that you were in a household open to everyone. And I really feel like when I'm listening to you and I watch you and I follow you and I'm so inspired by you, I feel like your childhood, you know, those nuggets of knowledge and the fact that your father gave you lots of books to read and you pass down that idea onto your grandchildren. I think that for me, when I'm listening to you, for me, that's your culture of peace in some ways. I just wanted to say that. Thank you that you mentioned about the book. I will show that book, the creating the culture of peace, an individual, uh, a clarion call for individual and collective transformation. This is a book co-written by myself and uh, uh, Dr. Daichaku Ikeda, a Buddhist philosopher and global leader for peace in the world. It came out during the uh, height of COVID last year. And uh, I'm uh, very uh, sad that uh, the promotion of the book which was supposed to be at the United Nations and other parts of the world could not be done. So we had an UN uh, United States launch last December of that book. Sorry to digress. You're never digressing, Ambassador Shadri. You're everything, especially to me, in terms of what you've been building, what you've been inspiring. I mean, I don't want to jump. I have questions here. You know, I want to jump to women, but we'll talk about women in a second. The next question is, what are some of the initiatives that have been successful to support marginalized communities? I think maybe I, in, in my life's work, I had devoted a big part of it, not only working for the culture of peace, but also working for the poorest and the most vulnerable countries of the world. So, if you, you have to separate the two parts. One is the marginalized communities uh, in the context of promoting the peace and sustainability of peace. The other is the marginalized and vulnerable countries of the world. If you put them together, there are three most vulnerable categories of countries in the United Nations. One is the least developed countries, the poorest. The other is the landlocked developing countries, which are not able to have, because, because of geographical reasons, no access to the sea. And the third group is the small island developing states, which are idyllic places in the world. We all see them in tourism brochures, but they are really disadvantaged in a big way because of the remoteness and because of the huge sea. So one side is landlocked and these small countries are what I call sea locked because the sea creates distance. So they cannot sell their products abroad because the cost of sending those products become very prohibitive for the buyer. So I have been, the, uh, the United Nations created a mechanism with a, a senior official at the level of Under Secretary General to work for that, to promote the 
best interest of these countries. And I was the first incumbent of that office for six years. So I believe that I, can, I could champion their cause in the best way. Bangladesh is one of the least developed countries. It has done well and would be maybe soon getting out of the list. Uh, and the, there are uh, efforts uh, which were successful during my time is to get their um, cancellation of their debts by, uh, with the industrialized countries, uh, increasing their market access of their products to these countries. So duty-free, quota-free um, uh, arrangements were made. Uh, everything but guns was the, uh, that they can sell everything or receive everything without receiving the armaments. So these were the kind of thing. And then of course, the basic motivation was to empower people. How, to, how people can get encouraged to fend for themselves without depending for global charity. And I think that that is an important thing, but we need international cooperation to bring pe people together. We need global solidarity. You cannot consider yourself part of a prosperous world uh, by leaving a big chunk of the people outside. Uh, uh, for the uh, total number of uh, vulnerable countries, as, as many as 90 countries of 193 members of the UN. So it's a big number of countries and a big population, uh, 1 billion plus people. So one seventh of the international community. So you cannot consider world to be moving ahead and uh, uh, with, uh, with the objective of prosperity uh, without uh, these countries. And these are the voiceless countries of the world because of their uh, vulnerability they are not able to emphasize what their needs are or make a dent in the global decision-making process. But uh, going back to the communities for the culture of peace, I believe that sustainability of development is very important because poverty is one of the biggest uh, disruptors of peace. And this is very important for us to bear in mind. But my thinking is that and I think I, I, my thinking, uh, or I shared many other people's thinking that it is very important to start with the communities. Communities should feel that we should um, uh, address the challenges that we face through our schools, through our uh, community activities, through our parents, through our teachers, through other professional groups to really support the community's effort to improve the condition of people in that, those communities, to ensure that today's young people grow up with a positive attitude towards life. And I think we live, as we call, in a global village. So we have to understand that if I'm happy, say I'm, I may be happy, in my household, I, am, I have uh, everything that I need, but that is not necessarily ensure my safety or security. The moment I go out in the street, I'm done. And, and I cannot just leave um, uh, in my household forever. So we need to communicate with each other. So it, it is um, necessary that we try to make our communities safe for each one of us. And once that is done, it will expand into bigger areas and then finally the nations of the world and then globally. So exponential um, uh, uh, mechanism is the best way to promote the culture of peace from individual to the global. Speaking of individual, let's talk about women for a minute. You know, you are proud to say you are a feminist and I love it. 
And the fact is, you know that I had read in terms of your issues, you've supported women for decades. Let's talk a little bit about that and how that relates to the culture of peace, the power of women. Culture of peace actually uh, evolved out of the, uh, the Cold War. You know, United Nations um, as an institution evolved after 1945, after the end of the Second World War. And for the culture of peace, it emerged after when the Cold War, uh, the bitterest uh, rivalry between superpowers, um, uh, largest number of proxy wars started ending. And we were very encouraged that this is the time that we will have that. So 1997, as uh, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned in a letter along with few other ambassadors um, to, to the Secretary General of that time, Kofi Annan, my good friend, and um, suggested that we should have a separate self-standing uh, high level agenda item on the culture of peace. And that created the last three years of the last millennium, last decade in 1997, I proposed that item and it was accepted. Then the UN adopted an international year of the culture of peace in 97. In 1998, people said one year is not enough. So the Nobel Peace Laureate wrote to me to suggest that we should have a decade for the culture of peace. So 2000, 2001 to 2010 was declared in 1998. So 97 the year, 98 the decade, and then in 1999, we said, that we have a year and we have a decade, but why, what do we tell people to do? So then there came the program of action and the declaration, which described the culture of peace and which said, set up eight program areas for action. And those program areas starts with uh, education, uh, obviously, and then it, brings in the sustainability of development, economic and social development. Third is human rights. And fourth is equality between women and men. And that is, we structured also previously in view of the grammatical reasons, um, English grammar, that men comes first and then women. But we ensured that women comes first here because they need attention, equal attention. So in the name of grammar, we cannot make them secondary. So that is, and that now has become a common thing. Every good objectives, we put women first. The same way we did the Security Council resolution on women, peace and security. So that, that is how I believe that um, the culture of peace and women's equality is very closely linked. And I, I believe that it is very important. And I have been um, inspired immensely as I went around to the farthest corners of the world, um, working for the United Nations, working for my own country, Bangladesh. And uh, I found the resolve and the determination of women contributing to creating as um, individual space, social space for peace. I think we ha I have seen in West Africa, men were all fighting in the bushes and uh, uh, leaving their families in charge of women, grandmothers, mothers, even uh, younger people, younger women, but they have managed to keep the social fabric intact. As men were fighting, 
as the conflicts are going on, they send their children to school to send, uh, put the food on the table, could give them health care and other kinds of cares and security. So when men after the wars ended, peace agreements were made, they came back and they were, uh, I, I do not think they were pleasantly surprised. They were unhappily surprised that how come we have lost our space of power? The women have taken over and are doing fairly well. So that is when the, the also I, I find the United Nations started ensuring that there's in the new structures of parliamentary structure or government structure, there should be at least in the parliament members should be at least 30% women. So that was the, uh, now of course, uh, we always claim that it should be 50-50, nothing less than 50-50. Than so this is very important because, you know, by leaving women out, by marginalizing them, you are denying 50% of the humanity an opportunity to uh, be of service to their own countries, to their own communities. So that, that is a very important and uh, women's empowerment is a, an, an a most essential element. We, women have been marginalized for ages and it is very important that they are brought in at the equal level at all decision-making level. I think that when we do that, when we are able to give them that respect and that honor of uh, participating with uh, men, uh, I, I, as, I, as you said, I say that I'm proud to be a feminist and all of us need to be because that is how you make a better world. Feminism is not men against women or women against men. It is for all of us. Women's issues are no longer women's issues only. They are issues for humanity to be careful about and to be conscious about. So I believe that um, the earlier notion of feminism is no longer valid. Feminism is a smart policy and every country should have that feminist aspect in their policy making. I think that is important, uh, be it social policy, mm, foreign policy, uh, development policy, anything. I think women have an equal role. And I think women also bring in a new perspective, a new um, uh, freshness into the table to discuss. So uh, now uh, many peace negotiations, peace discussions, peace tables do not have enough women, very minimal. So we are ensuring that this is the, the movement put women on the peace table. And I see this as a general um, issue because it's not just peace. Peace table is um, maybe an example, but everywhere in every table, be it the corporate sector, be it uh, the home sector, be it either uh, community sector, everywhere we need to ensure women's um, contribution, women's equal participation to ensure that our decisions are appropriately made. Yeah, I read in your book that you would like to see a woman heading the UN at some point. Of course, we have nine secretaries general, all men, 76 years old organization. This year, we will be selecting the 10th secretary general of the United Nations. And um, I think, the way the politics is evolving, it looks like we will be still denied the opportunity to make a woman 
Secretary General of the United Nations. It's high time who even has been a big advocate for women's equality worldwide. But uh, I will tell you one uh, little um, uh, uh, um, uh, trivia, as some, but it's more than trivia. United Nations Charter is the first international agreement or treaty which has mentioned about equality between women and men formally. So that, that is why I say that this organization cannot go on denying the women a right to become the Secretary General. It's, it's absolutely obvious, and I, I, it is a high time. For the last time in 2016, I was part of a campaign to elect a new Secretary General, a woman Secretary General, and we had wonderful candidate, but politics um, denied them that. And again, now we are uh, about to select a new Secretary General. I do not know what will happen, but it does not look like. And uh, that that is a, one of the thing I want to see that happens during my lifetime. And uh, I would very much like to see it happens now. Wow. I'd like to see it happen now too, Ambassador. Speaking of the feminine, let's talk about Mother Earth for a minute. What's your relationship with culture and the earth from a healing perspective? Because I know that you also are an avid reader. You love art, you love poetry. I just wanna understand like from a healing perspective, how do you see those two earth and culture merging together? Well, um, I would not, uh go as far as calling it a culture, but I will say our existence. Mother Earth sustains us. We cannot separate ourselves. Humanity cannot separate itself um, uh, without really respecting that everything we are is, has been given to us by the Mother Earth. Everything our intelligence and intellectual capacity to our human health or human capacity, physical capacity, everything. And I believe sooner we understand our connection with planet Earth is very important that we, it is our, we have only one planet where humanity can live and they, we have to ensure that we cannot destroy our own home. We are crazily thinking of development, progress, growth. This addiction for growth is dangerous. It is not only cleaning, killing our planet, but also clean, uh, killing our people. And there, I would like to also bring another element very much importantly, that this, the process of militarism and militarization, which is going throughout the world, is a dangerous obsession, a dangerous suicidal path that is pushing us to destroy. And the, the militarism, is, is absolutely destroying our world in a big way. So it is very important that we connect all these things and ensure that the flora and the fauna and the, the atmosphere, um, uh, we are now in the midst of the climate change debate. And uh, we believe sooner we agree on the basic things and sooner we uh, agree to act they are better for our world, our children. Sometimes in our anxiety to make more money, to uh, be rich, uh, we forget that we are pushing our own children and grandchildren towards a desolate earth where they will be looking around, begging for some fresh air. And that, that is the challenge we are putting but we are so crazily 
addicted to wealth and richness that we forget that there is something called um, a, a peaceful uh, and satisfied world. We, you know, the Mahatma Gandhi, the great apostle of peace had says, the world has everything that we need, but not everything that we greed. So that greediness has to, to end this mm. eager uh, rat race for increasing our personal wealth. Uh, we should spend more time thinking of how we can protect our planet in a better way. Uh, that, that is called progress. Not uh, progress is that taking away from one group of people, making them impoverished and enriching myself. What has happened over the, over the decades, centuries, the colonialist, colonialists enrich themselves and now they are putting the whole burden of climate change on these poorest of the people. Bangladesh does not contribute even 0.0001% uh, to the global climate um, uh, change, but it has to bear one of the heaviest burdens because the sea level rise will inundate one third of the country and that will displace millions of people. Bangladesh is a very densely populated country. But this, this is true about not only Bangladesh, a number of other countries. Small islands I mentioned to you earlier, number of them are threatened to disappear from the, uh, from the face of the earth. Yes. Some, some years ago, one island country started uh, uh, creating a tourism slogan. Come to our country before it vanishes from the world. That's a lot to take in right now, but you know, we don't, we don't, I feel that we don't have time to sit on the sidelines and kind of ponder what you just said. You know, it's go time right now. And we truly appreciate all that you're doing. And again, being in this conversation, I'd like to ask you, speaking of all that, given that you're doing all this work that's like game changing, what's your sacred space for healing? You know, where do you go for your moments of healing? I, I think um, I may be sounding a little naive, but I should say I go to people. I think humanity encourages me. That is my space. I do not want to be isolated in, in, a, in a temple or in a, in a place of worship or even in a quietness of your home to find my space. I find my space when I am with the people. I enjoy being with the people, learning about their hopes and aspirations, sharing my thoughts with them. And that is what I believe is my space. I, that is why COVID-19 created a big trauma uh, for me. And I think, uh, Apart from um, uh, losing my uh, partner for half a century uh, it, during this time uh, was um, a, a very sad thing. And I believe that both ways I was uh, uh, denied uh, this opportunity to communicate with people, to have the company and the love and the inspiration of my wife, and uh, that that is something uh, which uh, COVID nineteen has denied me. And but uh, I still continue to hope. I interact with people in these kind of situations through Zoom, through telephone, through emails. Uh, I people encourage me all the time. People inspire me. I should say. Please accept my condolences personally, Ambassador. I was about to ask you a question, but you already answered it. What inspires you? And while you were speaking in my mind, I was thinking, oh, I know what inspires him, people. But is there anything else that you want to add to that? 
Simple things inspire me. I believe when I see uh, uh, little kids going in, in, the, in our apartment complex, uh, playing with each other, um, uh, and when I say a very senior uh, woman and man um, try to saying hello to them or encourage them or throwing back their ball, which comes that way as they are playing. So these are the gestures which make me happy. And also in a bigger things like, um, like uh, when I uh, see this pin, which is the culture of peace pin on its 20th anniversary. The raised hands are hands uh, which are part of the global movement for the culture of peace, which happens to be the name of the organization that I founded. And I get very encouraged. I get very encouraged. I mentioned, and you mentioned about uh, the women's equality resolution 1325. So this, when I see, I get encouraged, inspired. So many things. And then also, I, I am very happy to write this message for uh, release and become, uh, which uh, you uh, wonderfully prepared. And uh, that's a book I want that everybody should read and keep available for themselves. And this is, this is a big contribution, uh, Ms. Bullard, that you made. And I believe also that um, uh, the, our little acts of uh, peace and nonviolence, our little respect for each other, our um, uh, reducing our prejudice and discrimination and sense of undue competition is what should be uh, necessary. I, in 2012, when I was the commencement speaker at the University of Massachusetts in Boston, I mentioned a few sentences, but one I said, do not sell your soul at the cost of other people. So do not try to, you know, your soul is your own and it is the most proud position that you have. Do not sell it to get a promotion, to get a job or, you know, sometimes denying another person that. So it is very important that we, we should uh, fill the integrity of our soul in, in ourselves. That is necessary. And I believe that in, in a broader context of your book and your efforts for healing, I think healing is when you feel comfortable what, with what you are doing. Then the spirit that you have inside you makes you better a better human being. I think culture of peace or the efforts for healing, the World Healing Day's mission statement tells everything in the same way that we move from individual to the global. We move from individual to communities, to nations and to the world. Same with the culture of peace because it is very important for us to remember that uh, is all of us to have to make the simple effort to become a good human being. That, that you will take away many of the challenges or um, uh, uh, ailments that we are facing in today's world. We have never tried. We have isolated ourselves from anything happening outside us. But nothing is happening without human may beings making that happen. So we cannot blame, we cannot but blame ourselves for what we have done. So we should wake up and tell ourselves, okay, I have been giving the responsibility to other people, but it's me who should be the, at the outset of the whole effort. When I'm listening to you in my mind, I'm thinking your words. For me, they are a treatment to dissolve trauma. 
you know, because right now I don't, I don't know about anyone else on this conversation, but I think all of us are afflicted with trauma. I mean, it's just like everywhere now, you know, it's kind of in the pores and the walls, you know, so do you have any comments in terms of, which I think you already talked about, but is there anything else you wanted to say about resolving, resolving what may not be the right term, but de dealing with trauma ambassador? I think um, uh, we sometimes we um, uh, overrate trauma. We are going through trauma, uh, trauma of various levels of intensity. We find that in everybody's life and life without challenges is no life. I cannot have a, a steak every day and enjoy. Um, so it is very important that uh, I, I tell my students all the time that do not be afraid of failure because failure is a stepping stone to success. And the, the same way, we should not feel that my life should be without trauma. It happens, it comes even without us asking for it, like we are now going through the COVID-19 trauma. Um, we didn't want, we uh, nobody wanted, and it's so interconnecting that if I am safe and secure and healthy, I help another person to be self secure and healthy. And that is the, in a negative way, the connectivity that we are talking about. So it is very important and do not never underestimate yourself or undermine yourself as you face a trauma. Self-worth is very important, that I am an important person, not in terms of my level, important person and individual uh, having desire to contribute to the world. I am part of a bigger humanity of 7.4 billion people in the world. So that, that is very important. And also I believe that, uh, we, have, we need to look forward, look ahead, uh, but we should not be in a hurry as we come out of a trauma. We should give us time, make a slow process, and I think that helps um, organizing yourself uh, better to face trauma. And also I think um, when a challenge comes uh, in the shape of a trauma, we should tell ourselves that maybe this has an opportunity to give me something better for the future. Uh, I can learn a lesson from this trauma and move to prepare ourselves to face similar traumas or even um, other kinds of traumas in a better way. So resoluteness is important but it should be soft resoluteness. Not say that I am just going to face it and get it out of my, my life. No, it will never happen. The more you resist, more you are in trouble. So resistance should be avoided. Gently allow yourself to ease the situation in the best possible way. And we, we in our life is full of trauma, a small, minor or bigger. Uh, it does not, uh, it should not bother us in that way. We should be comfortable, like weather changes uh, as we move through the year. Um, and we prepare ourselves the same. The, I will, in my life will have uh, challenges, trauma. I always not, call it trauma, I call it challenges. Because at the moment you give the name trauma, it has a connotation and it has a scientific psychological meaning. So challenges, uh, sometimes people overrate challenge as trauma and sometimes people underrate trauma as challenge. Uh, so, but um, we, we, we need to understand what, what we are talking about and what role I can play to handle it myself. Yes, of course, the community support, family support, 
uh, friend support is important. So that that connectivity, I I for uh, my challenges or my complexities of life or my problems, I reach out to my friends, and I believe that when my family is of course the the core of my my um, support base, but I also reach out to my friends, and I believe that 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 is very very helpful. So connectivity with the outside world is very important. And this is my last question, because I want to find out if there are more questions. Are there any questions? No questions? Okay, I'll keep going. When you were speaking, I was thinking about, you know, activism. How can we have our voices be heard when we are feeling all these things? I know it's like peaceful protests. What is your take on letting our voice be heard? I'm talking from the ground. I'm in Brooklyn right now, Ambassador. So I just want to get a sense of, you know, what are your thoughts in terms of taking what we're feeling and integrating it into community activism or different platforms that are accessible? Yes, so now we are going through uh, many challenges like uh, Black Lives Matter is a very important challenge in front of us. Uh, we, we are facing it. We are uh, sort of trying to articulate our thinking, our activism, our action-oriented contribution. And I, I believe that, um, as I said, that activism should be uh, internally generated and believed. I cannot go out in the street uh, with a placard and come back home and I am my old, old, um, uh, negative self. I should try to connect my activism with my own self. So that that is what I believe and I always tell my children, grandchildren and uh, friends, everybody, that you have to be a believer, a true believer in activism in a positive way. It's not that I will go and burn some uh, parts of the city and I will protest. <clears throat> protest has to be positive. Uh, there, there is no negative protest. Uh, so that is important. But in the context of activism, that I found a, a new sort of description has emerged in recent times. It's called, and I'm sure you have heard about it, it's called bouquet of humanity. Bouquet of humanity, this is the attorney general of a state of America uh, coined this phrase and it has become very popular. And it is connected with the George Floyd situation. And there they found that individuals came, women took the video, others came and started pleading with the police let that man go, he's dying, he's, you know, he has no movement. And the shopkeepers, the, um, the uh, storekeepers all came standing by and urging the police. And these individual actions are an activism which together is called a bouquet of humanity. Each one of us have, each one of us are flowers and all of us put together become a bouquet of humanity in a um, place for objecting, protesting a bad negative act. So that I believe that this is an important element where we should remember that activism is not when it is organized. Activism is, should be part of our daily life. If I see somebody stumbling in the street, I should be there to help him or her out. I should, uh, or if somebody is trying to uh, misbehave with a, a man or a old man or a woman, um, we should be there to say, why are you doing that? And this also I object 
uh, that I, or I um, emphasize that it should be done in a nonviolent, peaceful way, in a gentle, respectful way. Uh, because I do not know the background of what is happening. But so I should say, can you not discuss this peacefully and resolve it? This, this person is suffering. So help. So this is very important. And I believe that our daily life, you know, if I see a, 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 a something which is on the street, which uh, over which somebody else might stumble, I should be willing to pick that up and throw it away or put it in a trash can. The simple acts of concern and care is a true activism and true part of the bouquet of humanity. I have nothing else to say, which is strange for me. I normally have a lot to say, but the bouquet of humanity, I really feel that that should be taught in schools, starting even at home, at home first and in schools. I'm concerned about the education system right now, globally in terms of integrating the culture of peace in terms of curriculum. Is there anything you're working on or see happening in reference to that ambassador? I am working on in terms of, because after all, I cannot do everything. Uh, I am an advocate. I, I, uh, I promote the value of the culture of peace. I promote women's equality. And I promote for people who are able to take decisions or incorporate these ideas in their work. So this is what I, I do. And this is what I believe uh, can help. Uh, to to make them aware, uh, make them alert uh, about uh, what could be done and what what tools are available uh, with us to promote that. The the very fact that the program of action of the United Nations on the culture of peace is a globally accepted document. It has been agreed upon by all. 193 members of the United Nations, along with hundreds of thousands of civil society organizations and non-governmental organizations. So all these things are working in that way. So I believe that uh, what we need to do, and I have been talking to educationists and other people um, about putting this aspect of um, a child's development, early childhood development, um, uh, to be to for a child to grow up uh, as a peaceful, nonviolent person, and I believe that a very important thing for them to learn is about what is happening in the other parts of the world. It's very important for them not to be isolated from the rest of the world. I can be happy and healthy while there are millions of people who are not as fortunate as I am. So I think it is very important for our children to grow up understanding that uh, the world is interconnected, interdependent. So something negative happening elsewhere will affect me at one point in time. And climate change is a big example for that. Environment, environmental <coughs> Pollution is another thing that we see, and violence is another thing. We have violence, and it affects our societies. Today, uh, we cannot say that we are, nobody can touch us. The world is so connected. Uh, so that is why the children should go up, grow up knowing full well that we live in a bigger world. Some are happy, some are not. Some are able to get education, some are not. So we should understand that. And that, that is very important. And then I call that a global citizenship because you should be a, a global citizen in your attitude towards life as you grow up. I cannot just fend for my, myself, my family or my community or even my country because 
I cannot do that without denying the others. So that, that understand, that solidarity, human solidarity, oneness of humanity is very important for us to keep in mind. So I call this, uh, previously we used to call it peace education, but now I call education for global citizenship. That is uh, very important. And um, uh, the, the co-author of the book on the culture of peace that I wrote with Dr. Uh, Daisaku Ikeda, he promoted that global citizenship at a lecture uh, in 1996 at the Columbia University Teachers College. And that uh, process has now expanded in a big way. We have been able to incorporate the culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship as elements of education in goal four of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So that, that kind of education we need to, uh, not only children, but every one of us, we common people, we have uh, many grown up people who uh, is not aware of um, uh, the names of the countries of the world or uh, which part uh, of the world that country belongs to. So it is very important that we need to, we, we may be the superpower of the world in, in the United States, but that doesn't mean that we, we, we are disconnected with everybody because everything that we see uh, in our lives here uh, has foreign connection. Thank you, Ambassador Shallery. We really appreciate you. We really appreciate you connecting with us. We look forward to following you and touching base in the future. And on behalf of the team at Release and Become, we really appreciate your contribution to the book, your contribution to the projects that we do, and we want to just say again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And yes, especially on World Healing Day. I wish everyone a wonderful day. Take a moment and think about the amazing words of Ambassador Chowdhury and also take a moment for yourself and enjoy your day. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. All the best.